many of you guys are at least a few years older than I am, you probably remember 2006, when Pluto was demoted from its status as one of the nine planets to its current status as a dwarf planet. I, being about two and a half of the time, was not so deeply offended by this decision like many of the astronomers of the day were. While it is normal for astronomers to get heated over decisions like this, the redefinition of the word planet, which is what got Pluto demoted in the first place, remains to this day one of the International Astronomical Union's most egregious offenses. This is partially due to the fact that seven months prior, the New Horizons probe, a mission sent to actually go and investigate Pluto, was launched. The astronomers working on the project felt like their contribution was being devalued. But it's partially due to the fact that the definition they ended up choosing, well, kind of sucks. <laughs> I don't mean to be disrespectful or offensive, but it really is an awful definition. There's just not another way to put it. I can't make any claims as to why it hasn't been changed since 2006, but I can say that it ought to be replaced. To save Bill Nye and the rest of the IAU board some time, I've actually come up with what I believe is a much better definition. While my definition still excludes Pluto, I think you'll be very interested to hear that it also excludes Earth, but includes the Moon. To explain why this is the case, I'll first walk you through how we got to the definition we have now. I'll explain what exactly it is that's so wrong with it, and then I'll tell you what I would do to fix it. Astronomy has been around for about as long as people have. We've pretty much always been looking up at the sky. While much of early astronomy was based around mythos, every now and then the early astronomers would make an actual real scientific observation about what it was they were looking at. One interesting observation that pretty much every ancient civilization shared was that of seven objects that move across the sky in a pattern different from the stars. These objects are the Sun, Mercury, Venus, the Moon, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. While the stars are in fixed positions relative to each other, they'll always make the same constellations, these seven objects move along an arc called the elliptical. The solar system rests more or less along one plane, and this means that from Earth's perspective, all the major bodies wander along the arc in the sky. These were the first planets. In fact, the word planet comes from the Greek word planetes, which means wanderer. So the number of planets started at seven, and it was defined as the wandering lights in the sky. Now, eventually Copernicus would postulate the heliocentric nature of the solar system, and Galileo would later prove it, which brought the number of planets down to six as the sun and moon were kicked out of the club and Earth was brought in. But it wasn't until 1781 that a new planet was discovered. William Herschel wanted to name his discovery George after the king, but the Astronomical Society thought that was inappropriate and chose the name Uranus instead. <laughs> but we nudged the definition here and there, and now a planet is something that orbits the sun. Let's stop in 1801 for a little detour. This is the year Ceres, the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt, and now the smallest dwarf planet was discovered. It was actually classified as a planet initially. After all, what else do you call a round rocky object orbiting the sun? So in 1801 we had eight planets. But shortly after Ceres came Pallas, another rocky object orbiting the sun in the general area. Then came Juno, then Vesta, then Astraea. That's 12 planets. More and more planets were popping up and astronomers were starting to get a little worried. So they got together in 1850 to figure out what to do about all these new planets, which were now numbered at 18 since six more of Suri's friends had joined the party and Neptune, a regular old gas giant, had been discovered during this period. They decided to group Ceres and his little band of misfit planets into one group, which they called the asteroid belts. These were no longer planets, they were asteroids. We go back to eight planets, since Neptune obviously got to stay, and now the definition of a planet is something big that orbits the sun. Now we jump to 1930 when Pluto was discovered. Clyde Tombo was actually looking for a much larger planet, thought to be disturbing the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. It turned out that this disturbance was due to a faulty calculation of Neptune's mass, but in the sea of data astronomers had collected looking for this ninth planet, a little blip appeared. This turned out to be Pluto. Now, Uranus and Neptune, the planets that aren't visible in the night sky, are so much larger than and so much closer to Earth than Pluto is. It seems reasonable to expect that someone would stumble across them when surveying the night sky. But Pluto is very, very small and very, very far away. By all accounts, it shouldn't have been discovered for another 70 years. But astronomers in 1930 just so happened to be looking for another planet that should have appeared where Pluto happened to be sitting at. So Pluto was accepted in 1930, and we had nine planets. This wouldn't be challenged until the turn of the 21st century, when something very familiar started happening. A round rock a good leap beyond Neptune's orbit, called Quarar, was discovered in 2002 by Mike Brown and Chadwick Trulio. It was first classified as an asteroid, though it was much larger than your standard space rock. In fact, it was larger than Ceres. Then came Sedna in 2003, my personal favorite of the dwarf planets. Soon after came Haumea in 2004. If you're having flashbacks to the early 1800s, you're not alone. 
just like with the asteroid belt, astronomers were starting to realize that maybe these clustered similarly sized objects shouldn't be considered planets, which is what they were thinking they might have to classify them as. Since they hadn't actually started calling them planets yet, per se, they were actually comfortable keeping Pluto where it was and just calling the rest of them trans-Neptunian objects for the time being. But this was so long as they didn't find one larger than Pluto. Hey, you want to know what happened in 2005? Eris, a round rock, passed Neptune's orbit with a mass larger than Pluto's was discovered, which meant the IOU had to finally pin down what it actually meant to be a planet. They ended up deciding on the following. In order for an object to be considered a planet, it has to meet three criteria. One, it must orbit the sun without orbiting anything else. Two, it must have enough mass to maintain a near round shape. And three, it must have cleared the debris from its orbit. <sighs> I have a problem with this definition. Technically, none of the eight planets meet all three criteria. Starting with the first criterion, I have three major criticisms. The first is that nothing in our solar system actually orbits the sun. When a set of objects gravitationally interact, they orbit the system's center of mass. You'd think this would be somewhere within the sun, seeing as it contains 99% of the solar system's mass and has a radius of over 400,000 miles, but this actually isn't the case. As it turns out, Jupiter and Saturn are massive enough to pull that center of gravity outside the sun's radius. So everything in the solar system orbits this, including the sun which means nothing actually orbits the sun. My second criticism is that this criterion excludes everything outside of the solar system. The definition specifies the sun, which would make all exoplanets, which are planet-sized objects that orbit other stars, not planets. You would think those two terms would overlap, but they don't. The third criticism I have is that it also excludes rogue planets, which are planet-sized objects that don't orbit anything in particular. Compositionally, they're the same as star orbiting objects, they just happen to be located somewhere else. Moving forward, I'm actually not quite so mad at the second criterion. It has a pretty precise specification. For something to be considered near round, it has to have reached what's called hydrostatic equilibrium. For astronomical purposes, this just means symmetrically rounded, but there is a precise way to measure it. Now, despite uh, popular belief, Pluto actually does meet this criterion. It's the third one that got it kicked, and we'll see why later. Despite this, I still do have one criticism of this criterion. While it does clearly specify a lower bound for the mass of planets, it doesn't specify an upper bound. And this turns out to be kind of problematic. The largest planet type objects are called gas giants, and they're not too compositionally different from stars. What distincts gas giants from stars is the presence or absence of nuclear fusion, which is what makes stars shine. If an object made of hydrogen and helium gets massive enough, it will start to fuse hydrogen atoms together to make helium, which releases a huge amount of energy. The problem is that this line isn't quite so distinct as you'd think it would be. There's a blurred area between planets and stars, which is where brown dwarfs reside. Often called failed stars or overachieving planets, they don't really fit into either classification. While they don't fuse hydrogen to make helium, they accumulate matter much differently than gas giants do, and they're comprised of much less metal. The planet definition should resolve this confusion, and I'd argue that that's part of its primary purpose. Now we move to the third criterion, which is the one that Pluto and the other trans-Neptunian objects violate. They were excluded from the planet club because they're part of what's now known as the Kuiper Belt. Similar to the asteroid belt, it's a region where smaller rocky and icy objects congregate. This means they violate the third criterion, which states they must have cleared debris within their orbit. I've been a bit picky with the first two criterion. They can probably be resolved with a couple minor modifications, but the third criterion is just awful. After a bit of consideration and a lot of math, astronomers realize that clearing the debris has nothing to do with the properties of the object in question, but rather just where it's located. If Earth was suddenly teleported to the Kuiper Belt, so it would no longer be a planet, it's not gravitationally prominent enough to sweep all that matter up. Like the first criterion, this one judges an object by the place they live instead of by their character. But it gets worse. By this classification, Mars and Jupiter aren't planets. To help you understand why, I first need to explain what Lagrange points and Trojan objects are. When one object orbits another, five gravity wells form along the smaller body's orbit, numbered L1 to L5. These are called Lagrange points. These regions tend to catch passing asteroids and comets if the well is big enough. And when they do, that cosmic debris stays there and becomes what's called a Trojan object. It's thought that Jupiter's Lagrange points are part of the reason we have complex life on Earth. They catch most civilization-ending asteroids. 
We found a lot of terrestrial bodies in the habitable zone orbiting other stars, but a lot of them don't have a gas giant keeping all the asteroids away. Mars and Jupiter have a particularly large amount of Trojans on their L4 and L5 points. And I'm not sure about you, but a bunch of asteroids hanging out within a planet's orbit sounds a lot like unclear debris. So now we know each criterion is flawed in one way or another. Nothing orbits the sun, we have no upper bound for the mass of a planet, clearing the debris has nothing to do with the properties of the object, and Mars and Jupiter should have been demoted with Pluto. This definition as a whole is also just over-exclusionary. All of these flaws just make you wonder why this was implemented in the first place. I obviously can't speak for the IAU, but I think the reason they chose this definition isn't too hard to figure out. Up until 2006, the definition was just a list that changed with every new discovery, but there wasn't really a need for a formal way to categorize space rocks because on the rare occurrence that something new was discovered, its categorization had always been fairly obvious. But by 2006, we had the technology to see to the edge of our solar system and beyond, in enough detail to completely discern comparatively tiny worlds. And we were realizing that there were a lot of these worlds. Not all of them should be considered planets. So we knew we finally had to pin down the definition if we wanted to better understand these new discoveries. The problem was they just didn't want to shake things up too much. It was obvious Pluto needed to go, but they didn't want to mess with the other planets. They didn't want to change too much, so they did what we'd always been doing. And they just nudged the definition a bit until it conformed to their list and only their list. The goal wasn't to create a working definition that could be used to help classify new discoveries ad infinitum. Their goal was to account for the recent discoveries while maintaining as much of the status quo as possible. It's disappointing because I think if they'd taken that opportunity to really think about the purpose of the definition and how it actually would be used in the future, they would have realized that they needed to flip the current system on its head. I think this issue is a microcosm of a much larger issue in the world. Whether it be in politics, economics, or social structures, I think we frequently pass up the opportunity to really think critically about the systems that cause the problems in our world. We're much more willing to try short-term solutions because they aren't as disruptive. We like to maintain as much of the status quo as we can and just nudge policy a bit to account for the new symptoms of the larger problem. This isn't how meaningful change happens. But enough about problems, let's talk about solutions. I might not be able to fix the global economy, but I think I can fix the way we classify planets. I've been bitter about this definition for the past seven years, and I'm very eager to finally propose a way to fix it. After all, I did promise to explain to you why I think the moon should be a planet. <laughs> so first, I want you to forget about the word planet, just for a bit. I actually don't think we should continue using it in a scientific context. Because all of the historical connotations and rebranding it's gone through, it no longer has the perceived sense of exactness that's actually useful in science. We all have an idea of what a planet should be, but a lot of those objects are so compositionally dissimilar that it doesn't make sense to use it for formal classifications. I mean, just compare Jupiter and Mercury, they're absurdly different in size, composition, and placement. So when we discover a new smallish roundish object, I think we should place it in one of three categories. One, gas giants, spheres of gas that don't undergo nuclear fusion. Note that this category includes brown dwarfs now. Two, major terrestrial worlds, objects that are in hydrostatic equilibrium or are just round and made of rock. Within this category, we can specify whether the rock in question is orbiting a star, is a satellite of something else, or is just on its own. I want to mention, just a little side note here, that while I do want to remove the word planet from scientific contexts, I absolutely want to keep the word planet, that is spelled with a B, as in black hole. This is the real, actual scientific word for round things orbiting black holes. Astronomers come up with some of the best vocab terms, just ask the people who coined the two types of dark matter, which are called machos and wimps. Anyway, the third category would be for rocks that aren't at hydrostatic equilibrium. They'd either be asteroids or comets based on their ice content. So now we have a way to sort out our rocks and gas clouds, and now we can look back at the word planet. I don't think it's reasonable to think that people will stop using this word. It's deeply embedded in the public conscious, and it's been around for literally centuries. I see no reason as to why we have to get rid of it completely anyway. So how to define it? I propose we go back to the beginning. Observational astronomy is considered one of the first sciences. It's always been important to humanity. Even though folklore varied from region to region, almost every ancient civilization noticed the same seven lights wandering across the sky. I think maybe we could define planet in honor of these people who became the foundation of modern science. So to me, a planet is a natural object that moves along the elliptical and is visible to the naked eye, which means that my planets are the sun, Mercury, Venus, the moon, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. 
So maybe sometimes it's necessary to flip a definition on its head if we want to make useful change. When we're given the opportunity to reevaluate the structures our issues are built upon, I hope we can learn to challenge the status quo a bit more often.